Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests are Leah Chan Grinvald, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at Suffolk University Law School, and Ofer Tursunai, uh, Associate Professor of Law at Ono Academic College in Israel. We will discuss their article, Intellectual Property Law and the Right to Repair, which will be published in the Fordham Law Review. So welcome to the podcast, Leah and Ofer. Thanks for having us. Thank Brian. you, Brian. It's exciting to be here. Right. So I, I really enjoyed your paper because it's it it touches on a subject that's been very much kind of in the air for the last several years. But for listeners who may not be familiar with the concept, I wonder if you could just briefly explain what the right to repair is and why it seems to be endangered at the moment. Okay. Well, we all have products and our consumer products and equipment include nowadays um, lots of digital components, at least uh, a computer chip, and you can think about your car, your coffee maker, uh, your vacuum cleaner. So we all have embedded computer chip software, other technology, and this makes it a little bit trickier to repair. And in grown up days, when you can repair a product easily with a screwdriver, um, you need uh, some more sophisticated tool in order to do it yourself. And the problem is that manufacturers have been taking advantage of this product complexity to stymie the do-it-yourselfers and the independent repair shops that were making repairs in a variety of settings. And the right to repair is essentially a social movement that has arisen in recent years to demand um, to demand an intervention with these practices by the manufacturers and essentially legislate a right to repair. And this movement has been active on various fronts, but the most prominent one is pushing for state legislation. So far, uh, relevant laws have been presented in 20 states. And this is essentially the right to repair. What would stand at the center of this right under the proposed legislation is a duty uh, that would be imposed on the manufacturers to supply replacement parts, to supply repair information uh, in order to enable repairs by consumers and by independent repair shops and kind of reduce the monopolistic behavior that the manufacturers exert in this domain. So it's my understanding that we're operating in kind of a cultural milieu where historically there was an assumption that when consumers purchase consumer products, if those products broke or failed in some way, then they were perfectly entitled to either fix the products themselves, take it to a third party to fix the product, that the materials needed to fix a product would be available to them, whether you know made by the original manufacturer or by some third party manufacturer. And sort of this was historically how people assumed the consumer product market worked. But it seems like, as you noted, in recent years as a function of changes in technology, but maybe also changes in sort of business practices and assumptions and business models, maybe even the availability or the kind of the, both the possibility and maybe even like the legality of repairing uh, broken consumer products has, has changed. It, 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 is that right? And if so, kind of how did that happen? Yeah, um, you definitely sort of hit, I think, it on the head. Um, you know, we have these two um, disparate movements, right? The the you know inc increased technological advances of consumer products on the one hand, and then um, the increasing difficulty of repairing on the other. And and the two are not necessarily um, they don't have to go hand in hand, right? We could have very complicated. Uh, consumer products with if with the ability to repair them ourselves, um, so long as 
we were given, we, you know, being consumers, we're all consumers, right? Uh, we were given the ability and the access to the information and repair parts, but we're not. That, uh, as Oprah mentioned, the manufacturers have sort of taken it upon themselves to create their own closed networks, um, you know, funneling consumers um, to repair their products to only authorized networks, uh, which, by the way, are very hard um, and expensive to um, to break into if you're the independent repair guy on the outside. Um, and then on the other side, you, you also hit on a really good point, which is the legality of repairs. And so um, I think an unintended consequence, there's lots of unintended consequences from copyright law. And this is one of them, right? That because um, so many of our products these days run on software, when we buy our computers and our phones and even our vacuum cleaners, um, our coffee makers, we're not just buying the thing, we're also buying access to the software. And we're only getting access to the software, right? That we're you know, receiving this license to use the software. And if we don't get the updates, right, the, um, your, your, your thing may actually become um, obsolete. Um, and so that's, that's what's been going on. Right. So, it, it, I mean, it, it seems to me like in a lot of respects, companies are using intellectual property law to kind of structure the market for the products that they're producing. And I'd like to return to that in, in a minute, but I think it might be helpful for listeners if we talked a little bit kind of more granularly about how companies are actually using particular kinds of intellectual property in order to accomplish that goal to sort of understand better in a bigger picture sense how that how that's happening so, so maybe you could kind of touch on you talk about four different kind of categories of intellectual property in the paper patents uh copyrights trademarks and trade secrets i mean maybe we could walk through each one of those and sort of you could give some examples of how how that works or how companies use those forms of intellectual property to kind of limit or cabin the ability of consumers to repair the consumer products they're buying like for example what do they do with patents okay so um, under the patent system we have utility patents and design patents I'll start with design patents and, and the problem that design patents impose in this domain has to do with registration of design rights over replacement parts. So this is a practice that has grown in recent years, especially in the car industry, but not necessarily in the car industry. And there is an increase in grants of design patent, and they are also successfully asserted in litigation. And this makes it problematic to compete with the manufacturers uh, on this front. And without a competitive market for replacement parts, of course, repairs will be more difficult to be done outside this network of authorized repair persons that Liam mentioned before. So in this domain, for example, they simply use their intellectual property rights to suppress competition. And even though they don't do anything which is formally wrong under the intellectual property laws, they take advantage of their rights in order to gain advantages in markets that essentially have nothing to do with the primary market for which uh, we would like to give them intellectual property protection. And the flaw here, here is the ability that we grant them through our far-reaching intellectual property laws to register such rights to start with, but I guess we will get to the solutions a little bit later in the process. So this is one example of a practice by manufacturers to suppress repairs. Uh, then there's more uh, straightforward restrictions when you talk about utility patents. The license to use various products, starting with printers, for example, and ending in cars uh, can be accompanied with prohibitions on repair, prohibitions on reverse engineering, and this can be problematic as well. And this more or less have to do with the patent arena, but I'll let Leah give more examples on the copyright and trademark arena. Right. So, for example, I had mentioned earlier that clean software is protected by copyright law. And uh, what manufacturers are doing are placing um, these software locks on 
uh, on the product so that if you would like to repair or bring your product to your repair shop, if the repair shop owner doesn't have the uh, lock um, or know how to hack around it, they're not going to be able to access that software to, in order to repair your product. Um, with trademarks, um, it's a little more um, insidious in a way um, because, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the patents. So um, uh, manufacturers have been obtaining uh, trademark registrations on certain uh, designs uh, for cars, for other types of product repair parts. And they've been using the custom and border protection um, mechanisms uh, to um, have the government, the U.S. government, stop shipments at the border of these repair parts, um, claiming that parts that are lookalikes um, or even refurbished parts um, are counterfeit. And, uh, you know, for those of us who don't know trademark law all that well, uh, refurbished parts are not counterfeit, right? Uh, they have already been sold uh, and they've been fixed up. And so they're free for anybody to resell them in the United States. Uh, and yet we see time and time again allegations against importers um, for importing counterfeit products. And then la the last area of um, intellectual property that we um, touch upon in the paper are trade secrets. And that's really, I would say, the big black box of intellectual property rights that manufacturers are claiming. Um, because a trade secret, I mean, you know, really at the end of the day is what the manufacturer claims a trade secret is. Um, and, you know, as, for, for those of us who don't know trade secret law, it's, you know, those um, secrets or processes that have economic value uh, to the manufacturer by virtue of the fact that they are secret and that the manufacturer takes steps to uh, keep them a secret. And so what they've been doing is just claiming that all of the repair knowledge that, uh, we, you know, that would be needed to, um, to repair products is a trade secret. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I got to say, like reading your paper, I couldn't help coming away with the impression that to the extent that we think that these various categories of intellectual property rights are consistent with and support legitimate policy goals, it really seems like what you're pointing to is companies kind of abusing a lot of these rights in order to accomplish anti-competitive goals or kind of maybe not pro-consumer goals in relation to how people can use and maintain the consumer products that they're purchasing for the benefit of the companies rather than for the benefit of the consumers and the public. Am I right in kind of seeing that kind of general phenomenon? Yes, certainly. I mean, abuse, I think, is a strong word, but it might not be exaggerated in this context because intellectual property laws were not meant to bring about such results. And the companies certainly take advantage of every possible loophole in the way intellectual property laws are designed in order to gain these super competitive benefits in a way that really, really hurts not only consumers, but also these independent repair owners, not to mention environmental values, uh, and so, yeah, if we had to summarize our paper in one sentence, it would probably be intellectual property law should not be abused uh, in order to suppress the right to repair. So, so yeah, definitely. So in, in your paper, you acknowledge and talk about some of these right to repair bills that have been introduced in different state legislatures, but also kind of acknowledge that it doesn't seem like they're really going anywhere uh, at the moment for a range of different kind of policy reasons. And and you propose sort of a different framework of for thinking about sort of how to calibrate what we might call a right to repair to different ways of thinking about you know, when intellectual property rights are properly or improperly deployed. I, I wonder if you could kind of walk listeners through that framework you you suggest and how we might kind of think about sort of different ways of formulating a right to repair. Sure. So essentially, we'll start very quickly with the legislation. Uh, the legislation um, is essentially framed in consumer protection 
terms. And on its face, it doesn't seem to interface with intellectual property law. And the way intellectual property law comes up in the legislation process is mostly as a counter argument by the businesses. I mean, they rely on their intellectual property protection as a way to push back on the proposed legislation. Uh, what we are trying to do is come up with a theoretical framework that shows that the right to repair can be accommodated within the justification for intellectual property laws. In other words, we're trying to show that it's not a right to repair, and on the other end, intellectual property laws that block it, we're trying to show that the right to repair can actually be integrated within intellectual property law as an essential component of an intellectual property ecosystem. And in order to develop this framework, we essentially uh, embrace the utilitarian frame of thinking about intellectual property law. We also discuss it from the point of view of other theoretical foundations of intellectual property law, but the primary one is utilitarian, so we go along with it, and we show that designing intellectual property law in a manner that accommodates the concept of the right to repair and balances the right to intellectual property owners with such a right could serve the end, the utilitarian end of promoting progress. So this is essentially the argument, and if you want, we can go into more details, but you, you, you tell us whether to continue or you want to go over other dimensions of our project. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in particular, I was really interested in sort of the, the sort of four-part framework you talk about in terms of kind of practically speaking, thinking about what formulating a right to repair would look like if we took intellectual property law more kind of consciously into account. Right. So we definitely, we came up with this sort of um, concentric circles, which we have that will sort of footnote as, as an aside, you know, you don't have to, um, the readers or listeners don't have to agree with us on how we break it out, but we just thought conceptually it was easier for us um, and for hopefully others to visualize and frame the right to repair within this, within the, within these circles. And so at the core and, 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 as an aside, we also think that the legislation um, sort of skips over a lot of these um, uh, you know, circles or, or um, parts to the right to repair. And so I think breaking this down sort of lets us understand that, you know, even if we don't agree on some of the pieces of the right to repair, I think at, at, the, at the very core, that repair by individuals, we can all get on board with, right? That we buy these things, right? That we should have our own autonomy over, right? We should own the right to uh, use it and we should own the right to repair it if it breaks. We shouldn't be forced to um, to purchase a new product simply because uh, we, you know, uh, dropped it and the screen cracked, right? Uh, and, and the like. And so that's our first core, right? The core is the repair by individuals. And then we move out from there and we, we sort of visualize this as these concentric circles because as you get away, further away from the center of the right, um, we're asking, um, you know, government, we're asking courts, we're asking um, you know, manufacturers to uh, give up some of their, um, some of the, what, what they've been doing. <laughs> um, and so the second circle um, is this idea of diffusing information to facilitate repair. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, uh, advertising repair businesses, um, the ability to perhaps um, uh, say, you know, that you're able to repair the crack screen, that, you know, the, the ice cream um, line of businesses. After that are replacement parts. Super important, but as we've been mentioning, really hard to get a hold of, um, particularly when manufacturers own uh, and hold design patents um, or trademarks on them. Um, and then finally, sort of the, the the most probably troublesome, and this is where the legislation starts off at, and so you can see they've already sort of skipped over three important areas of the right to repair, the man mandating um, of information as well as parts to, uh, to facilitate and to um, really encourage repair by, um, by, by everyone in the, in the ecosystem. 
Okay, so companies certainly seem to be coming back and objecting to this idea that we ought to be including a right to repair in this conversation in the first place. And sort of one of the angles that they use is concerns about potential intellectual property infringement, but they offer other policy arguments too, it seems like. And I wonder if you could briefly sort of touch on some of those counter arguments and why people might potentially at least think that we ought to be cautious about expanding a right to repair, uh, both in relation to intellectual property rights, but in relation to other policy concerns as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I would say they have three broad tropes, um, you know, one being the intellectual property rights. Um, another is quality of repair. And then lastly, and I think this is really a subtext, um, is that, you know, having a broad right to repair enacted would actually mean an economic loss for them. Um, and so they're not going around shouting that from the rooftops, um, as you can probably imagine. What they're doing is they're focusing on IP and they're focusing on the quality of repair. And they're saying that, you know, it's not safe for you and I to have access to repair our products um, because we don't know what we're doing. Right. And they're, so, it's a, but, so we're going to protect you from yourselves uh, and not give you the information or the parts so that you are forced to go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, and so that's really the, the main thrust of their argument in the quality of repair, security, safety, you know, that you're going to open your phone or, you know, or product or what, whatnot, you know, um, to, you know, hacks or the like. Um, but what they're not getting is that people, you know, are doing this anyway. <laughs> um, they're hacking around, probably using downloads that they shouldn't be using. And if they were giving, given the information, given the parts, um, they could make a more informed decision as to whether or not they felt that they were truly capable of doing it themselves. Um, now, with the economic loss um, for them, that's sort of their subtext, um, you know, you know, argument against this. Um, you know, it is true. Um, you know, we have to say that uh, the repair business is big money, uh, and a number of these manufacturers do make um, a, a good portion of um, of revenue from repair. Um, and and yes, if you open up the, the you know competition, uh, they're going to make perhaps less than they have been making. But, you know, I think we should all remember that, you know, the, the default in our economy is competition, right? It's not, uh, it's not exclusivity. And intellectual property is really an exception to competition, an exception to exclusivity, and, or non-exclusivity, excuse me. And so we should really think carefully um, before we allow manufacturers, you know, full grants over um, this, this really important market. Yeah, I mean, one thing that really struck me about the story you tell in the paper is that there's this kind of abiding sense of disingenuity on the part of a lot of the manufacturers in relation to the intellectual property claims they're making counter to people exercising a right to repair. I mean, it just seems like in all these cases, there's an almost total lack of in, intent to infringe in any traditional sense on the part of the consumers and even third parties who are repairing these consumer products. And in, in a sense, they almost seem like the infringements you describe are almost like technical infringements that are sort of teed up by the companies themselves as ways of imposing kind of artificial legal restrictions on the ability of consumers and third parties to do things that we would otherwise take for granted. I mean, should that kind of, it almost seems like bad faith assertion of intellectual property rights cause us kind of policy concerns? I think the answer is mixed. I think it's tempting to blame these evil corporations for for all of this. Um, but I think um, in some instances, their arguments are really faulty. But in other instances, they simply use what we allow them to use by having such far-reaching intellectual property laws. I mean, by enabling them to register designs over replacement parts, 
uh, it's the legal regime that is suppressing a right to repair more so than the behavior of the corporations themselves. And I think it's really important to remember this because we cannot always expect the corporations not to use the levers that the law itself provides them. So, for example, in this new legislation, um, one area that is tackled in the model legislation is trade secrecy. Uh, when the legislation purports to mandate businesses to provide repair information, there's often in the proposed state legislation a caveat allowing corporations to hide behind trade secrecy law and avoid disclosing anything that they claim to be a trade secret. So I think when we draft this legislation to start with, we cannot count on the corporations to do a good job of only using this if it's truly a trade secret. Um, secret. Um, I think we should think about these things ahead of time and design the legislation appropriately in a way that will minimize the ability of the corporations to use the law in order to suppress the right to repair. It seems like this is a, a sort of a, not an unfamiliar story in the sense that when we grant certain kind of abstract legal rights to companies, we shouldn't be surprised when they use those rights in ways that are advantageous to their business interests, even if those the way that they use those rights isn't necessarily consistent with our abstract policy goals. And so it seems like in the background of your paper is the sense in which we should be thinking about intellectual pro policy goals in light of sort of the right to repair, to ask ourselves sort of, are the things we're legally enabling companies to do consistent with what we actually want sort of intellectual property policy to accomplish? And, 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 and maybe the right to repair is sort of a proxy for asking, what do we think intellectual property should enable in the first place? Yeah, I, th I think you definitely um, have hit that on the head, um, that the right to repair is just but one area where we see, uh, you know, companies and, and, and intellectual property rights owners really utilizing what has been given to them. And, and, I, and I think, you know, you're right that um, we can't blame them. And I think Ofer already mentioned something to that effect. We can't blame them for utilizing what is there. And so let's think, let's think ahead of time before we grant them, uh, before we grant these rights, what those policy um, goals should be. And with, with respect to the right to repair, I think one of the unthought of, sort of previously unthought of consequence of strong intellectual property rights um, is it, in, um, an impact on consumers and not a good impact on consumers. And so, you know, this is a great time to be thinking about, uh, I think Ofer mentioned trade secret law, for instance, let's Let's not give manufacturers an easy way out, but to claim anything and everything is a trade secret. Um, let's think more, you know, more, um, more thoughtfully about how this is going to impact consumers um, if this law was to be passed. Um, you know, there really, at this point, there is no mechanism for us to say what is and what is not a trade secret on any sort of expedited basis, on any uh, free basis, for instance. Um, all of it has to be litigated. And we all know litigation is expensive. Consumers aren't going to, you know, take up the, the baton um, for, you know, for, for, for you know, and, and say, I'm going to willingly pay, um, you know, six figure, you know, dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to try to litigate my right to to repair my screen phone, right? Um, they're just going to buy a new phone. And that then ends up by, you know, just so many, um, causing so many external harms, um, including, you know, your personal autonomy, the environment. Um, I mean, all, you know, I forget the, the recent figure I read about how many consumer products we're going to uh, throw away be just because we can't repair them. And I think uh, one one statistic I, I saw was that you could build with all of the tossed away uh, consumer products, you could build 
uh, 400 Eiffel Towers um, with all of that waste. So it, it really does add up um, and it really does have a, a huge impact. And so, you know, to get back to the point of your question, let's let's think about the policies that we want to promote. Let's think about e-waste, electronic waste. Let's think about how could we better recycle, reuse, repair our current products, uh, minimize the waste that's going into our um, into our landfills. In closing, to the to the extent that we think of intellectual property as at least partially being a form of innovation policy, it's it struck me that there's at least an argument that the right to repair could be consistent with encouraging innovation. In so far as sort of the the model you describe companies adopting is kind of using intellectual property to capture consumer audiences and avoid having to compete and um, by by preventing consumers from you know fixing things when they're broken or kind of forcing them to come back to the manufacturer if they want to repair a broken product and, and and it seemed to me that like, you know, if consumers have the ability to cheaply and easily repair products, it might kind of create a built in obligation or sort of commercial obligation for companies to focus on producing products that consumers might prefer to the product that they already have as opposed to repairing it. So, I mean, I wonder if there's a way if, if we could think about the right to repair as sort of a pro-innovation, pro-competition policy as well. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely correct. We absolutely think of right to repair as this pro-competition, pro-innovation um, type of uh, policy type of uh, thinking, um, you know, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Ofer in a second uh, to sort of flesh that out a little bit more to, you know, to kind of conclude with that. But I think, um, you know, that is absolutely a message that we hope uh, readers of our paper, as well as listeners um, of this podcast um, will take away. So here's Ofer on uh, some closing thoughts on that. Yes. Thank you, Leah. Uh, so I'll just add to what Leah said that one of the dimensions where we think acknowledging a right to repair is very consistent with the object of intellectual property law to incentivize innovation is by enabling user innovation. Some of our innovations come not from these huge uh, corporations, but actually from users of technology who might develop new products and services to satisfy their own needs rather than to sell them. And uh, this may be very beneficial, not to the individuals themselves, but also to society. And in order to enable and encourage such an environment where users innovate, intellectual property system must preserve a space to tinker, to experiment, to engage with products. And the right to repair is an essential component of such a legal environment. So on top of all the external reasons that were mentioned by Leah and by me before, the environmental reasons, the competition reasons, there's also this, meaning that even if we stick to the narrowest concept of progress that stand at the basis of intellectual property legislation, repair is essential to achieve our goals. At the same time, we do not think that a control of the markets to repair is essential for the companies to have an incentive to innovate to start with. And here's a good place to remember again what Leah said before, that our norm is competition. And in order to justify exclusivity, we need strong justifications. And we couldn't find, we tried hard, but we couldn't find a convincing justification to enable corporations to control markets for repair services and or replacement parts. And so this is it. Great. Well, thanks so much, Leah and Ofer, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed talking to you about this fascinating and uh, I hope provocative paper in terms of how we think about the right to repair and legislation in that context going forward. Well, thanks so much for having us, Brian. Yes, thank you, Brian. Thank you.
worked too hard, you ate too much, the cheesecake made you greedy. Let your aching head and stomach hear this message from old Speedy. Alka-Seltzer, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. Those Speedy bubbles relieve your upset stomach and headache fast. For acid indigestion alone, Alka-Seltzer Gold. Oh, what a relief it is. What a relief.